Hello. So a few years ago, my dad was reading me a bedtime story uh, from this book, Hannah Teeny's Extraordinary Origins of Everyday Things. And this book pretty much talks about uh, the history of everyday things from uh, marbles, band-aids, magazines, high heels, to even mattresses. Really, it's really quite fascinating. And I was recently thinking about this book and I remembered that there's a bit of a funny story behind why we have uniform green lawns in the United States. The origin of lawns, really, uh, starts out with the Greeks in about 400 BCE, and they would keep a small section of the land in front of their house really well manicured. They'd keep all sorts of wildflowers and different types of grasses in there, and it was meant to be a representation of the local landscapes and hillsides. Throughout history, different civilizations and cultures have loved having greenery in their open spaces, and this continued on with the British in the 19th century. Land was very constricted in England, as it's a small little country island. The wealthy loved to go hunting, but they didn't have very large spaces to go hunting in, so they would actually bring in animals to hunt, and they would create the best hunting conditions possible for themselves. So they would have the best horses, and most importantly, the best lawns and open spaces to go hunting in. This is where we start to see such vast open spaces that are all just one type of grass. Whereas the wealthy elite in America, when they wanted to go hunting, they could just go to the open frontier, they could just hop on a train and it would take them right out there, where they would literally have as far as they wanted to go hunting. And they weren't so concerned with the hunting conditions, because if they didn't like one space, they could go wherever else they wanted. So the ideal lawn that is all just one type of grass, it wasn't quite as popular in the US. It was still very popular to have a mixture of wildflowers and nettles and different types of grass to represent the local hillsides and open spaces. Author Nathaniel Hawthorne visited England and he commented in one of his books on how it was so bizarre to see the unnatural greenery in England. He talked about how the wealthy elite had intricate water sprinklers to keep the lawns just as green and perfect as possible. The popularity of monoculture lawns in the US only came about once lawn mowers were well introduced, which made it very easy to maintain such large spaces without having sheep or people to literally go around with shears and cut the grass. The popularity of the English lawn spread throughout the entire United States and today it's quite engraved in our culture. In fact, there are 63,000 square miles of lawn space now in the US. That's roughly the size of Texas. And to keep all this grass well-maintained, we use a lot of water. University of California. The University, the University of California Department of Natural, the University of California Department of Agriculture and Natural Resources, there we go, recommends one water. They recommend 0 0.623 gallons per square foot of lawn space weekly. This also means that if you have a 10 foot by 10 foot lawn, you are using 62.3 gallons of water per week. And this all adds up. We can convert 63,000 square miles into square feet, we get 1.7 trillion square feet of lawn space. If we multiply this by water used in a week, which is 6.23 gallons, that equals just over 1 trillion gallons of water used per week. Then if we multiply that by the exact number of weeks there are in a year, which is 52.1429, we get approximately 57 trillion gallons of water used in the U.S. just for lawns alone annually. The EPA has taken notice of this and they find lawns to be very destructive, not only for water use, but also because of fertilizer. 
Synthetic fertilizers are notorious for releasing NO2 or nitrous dioxide into the atmosphere. This is a gas that is very destructive to the ozone layer. Funny enough, the uh, first paper I ever wrote in high school was about how destructive nitrous dioxide is. I recently reread it, and oh my god, it's awful. Just, ugh. So I live in California, and we are in a bit of a drought, as you might know. And our governor, Jerry Brown, signed a signed an executive order which allows for California residents to receive a rebate for converting lawn space into water-friendly mulch or gardens. You can earn $2 for every square foot of space that you actually convert to a water-friendly solution. The public library in my town is actually converting a large portion of the park next to it into a water-friendly public garden. Many of my neighbors have water-friendly lawns just because of the high water prices. It really doesn't take much to find a house that has mulch in their yard. These four houses here are all right next to each other, so that's not really an uncommon occurrence. This design of yard is much more similar to the 19th century classic American ideal of a yard compared to modern-day suburbia. Maybe try looking into different water-saving solutions that you have for yourself. Um, it helps not only your paycheck, but also the planet. And it might be more classically American. Now, I really can't make a conclusion to these kinds of things. So here in California, whether it's different types of grass or different types of weed that you have in your yard, it's all legal. Okay, so hope you enjoyed that. Um, this is kind of like my first video making, talking about stuff like this. So this was quite an experience. Um, I have my sources in the description if you want to check those out. Um, there are some cool things down there if you want to read up on more stuff. Um, yeah, save water. I don't know why I made this as my first video, but it's a start. Yeah. So, see you guys next week.